Hello and welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and in this episode, we're going to do a deep dive into small modular nuclear reactors. Since the Dunkley by-election, and we'll get to Dunkley in a future episode, there's been an ongoing debate about nuclear energy, if you want to dignify it by calling it a debate. The coalition has a fairly vague suggestion that small modular reactors, or SMRs, are somehow the solution to not just the high cost of energy in Australia, but also our transition to a low carbon future. As if renewable energy was somehow expensive, difficult to deploy, and environmentally destructive. Oh yeah, like nuclear energy is. What's been interesting about this debate has been the framing of small modular reactors as kind of Clayton's reactors, you know, the nuclear reactor you have when you don't actually want a nuclear reactor. Because they're small modular reactors, they're not those big scary reactors that melt down through human error like Chernobyl or through natural disaster like Fukushima. The impression that the pro-nuclear lobby is giving almost makes them sound like Lego reactors. They're small and modular and they're cute. They sound like something you'd pick up at Ikea. And why wouldn't you want to adopt one? But the unfortunate reality is that at the end of the day, they're still nuclear reactors. They might be small, but that means you need more of them to generate the same amount of energy a big reactor would generate. Hence the modular bit, because you need several small reactors. In the interest of transparency, I do need to point out that the Democrats are anti-nuclear. We've been anti-nuclear for decades. We negotiated the federal ban on nuclear as part of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act in 1999. A staffer to our national president, Lynn Allison, went on to be part of ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, that won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. So we have form in this area. Now, you might be wondering if, having negotiated the ban on nuclear 25 years ago, circumstances have changed. Has nuclear technology evolved? Is it feasible now to lift the ban and look at building a nuclear industry in Australia? Can we pop down to IKEA and pick up some small modular reactors? And would they make a difference? And just what is a small modular reactor? My Democrats colleague and fellow Vice President, Dr. Graham Elder, wondered about this at the end of last year. And being a curious person, like most Democrats, and being an academic, he decided that instead of investigating SMRs to sate his own curiosity, he would report back to the party and to the public. In January, Graham published the first instalment of what he's calling The Drill, where he takes an issue that he's curious about, does the research, and then presents his findings for our members and members of the public to review and make up their own minds. The first topic that the drill covered was small modular reactors, which has come in really handy when I decided I needed to address the sudden push for nuclear energy by the coalition. I've put a link in the show notes to the drill, since Graham has provided charts and, and links for further context, which doesn't really translate into an audio medium, and you might want to go look it up after you've listened to this. Today's episode is a recording of the drill on SMRs with additional commentary and context from me. This episode was written by Dr. Graham Elder and me, and we pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we wrote and produced this episode and their elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. The drill. Nuclear SMRs. The need for continuous baseload power has been a recurring theme for years, with coal and gas seen as firming options. Nuclear power has also been considered as a non carbon emitting alternative, and given that Australia does not have a commercial nuclear industry, the concept of, quote, off the shelf, unquote, nuclear small modular reactors, SMRs, has been raised, particularly by the coalition. But is this a reasonable response to Australia's need to transition rapidly to a low-carbon future? There are a number of layers to this question. Apart from increasing needs for non-polluting power, Peter Dutton recently suggested that Australia should not be dependent on China as a major source of solar and wind technology, but should instead overturn its legislative ban on nuclear power and supplement that technology by introducing nuclear SMRs 
or micro-modular reactors, MMRs, from the US, UK, France, quote, and other trusted partners, unquote. By calling SMRs a, quote, companion technology to renewables, unquote, he was clearly trying to tread a line between coalition hardliners and teal voters opposed to high carbon emissions. He went on to say that, quote, there is no better example of the risk of over-reliance on one market than what we saw with many European countries' dependence on Russian gas, unquote, and that the nuclear submarines Australia is committed to under AUKUS, quote, are essentially floating SMRs, unquote. An important economic marketing point was that the inclusion of nuclear would facilitate the pathway to, quote, an Australia where we can decarbonise and, at the same time, deliver cheaper, more reliable and lower emission electricity, unquote. By comparison, a report by the Australian Conservation Foundation in October 2023 said the next generation of nuclear reactors being advocated by the coalition would, quote, raise electricity prices, slow the uptake of renewables, and introduce new risks from nuclear waste, unquote. If you have an instinctive response to the nuclear option, either negative or positive, but need evidence to confirm or reject your assumptions and question your certainties, so do I. France's dependence on nuclear power, Sweden's continued use of nuclear energy despite an earlier referendum to close it down, and Germany's concerns for the complete closure of nuclear power in 2023 are lessons to be considered. So that's where the drill comes in. Can the answers be found in a few hours of online inquiry using the scientific method and unbiased evidence, although unbiased evidence is clearly an oxymoron? In this edition of The Drill, I plan to frame the question, provide methods for the search, succinct results without commentary, and a short, more discursive discussion. Then you make your own conclusions, including responding if you can identify where I may have gone wrong. And I should stress, all commentary and context is provided by me, Alana, and not Graham. Aims. There are many nuclear questions, but I'm restricting this to, are nuclear small modular reactors, SMRs, being used successfully elsewhere? And if so, do they have a future in Australia's energy transition and mix? Methods. I search for information relating to this question in publicly accessible reports from 2022 to 2024. This proved to be more challenging than expected because, in most cases, reports were published by stakeholders with conflicts of interest. The most balanced report was luckily the most comprehensive from the CSIRO. The web URLs for my sources are provided below. Context Alana here. As I said at the top of the episode, there will be a link in the show notes to the edition of the drill so you can access the URLs to Graham sources and any other sources that I end up using. Back to the drill. Results. First, we do need some definitions. Nuclear SMRs are newer generation reactors defined by their power output. They are designed to generate electric power at typically less than 300 megawatt electric and may also be used for non-electrical industrial applications such as water desalination and heat generation for industry. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency booklet on advances in SMR technology developments published in 2022, there are more than 80 SMR concepts currently under development, ranging from single unit installations to multi-module plants. Manufacturing, assembly and testing may occur in factory, and siting may be on-ground, underground, floating, underwater, or movable. Therefore, nuclear SMRs may be applicable to regions lacking electrical grid and cooling water infrastructure. So where are nuclear SMRs currently operating? China has one prototype nuclear SMR, the Linglong-1, which is a multi-purpose 125 megawatt electric pressurised water reactor. Construction started on the 13th of July 2021, and according to Chinese Global Times, from the 6th of September 2023, it is expected to be completed and put into operation in 2026. China sees potential for deploying nuclear SMR technology and Chinese professionals to oversee it to partner countries, particularly developing countries and those participating in the Belt and Road Initiative. 
a spokesperson for the Nuclear Power Institute of China, said that the Linglong One is a highly suitable nuclear energy technology for cities that have a relatively small grid and for islands where large nuclear plants cannot fit. A 2023 report ordered by the British House of Commons, 13th of July 2023, highlighted the investment by China in the UK energy market, and in particular in the nuclear energy sector, and seeks to further its influence by exporting nuclear technology. Russia has four land-based operating EGP-6 SMRs, which formed the Bilbino Nuclear Power Plant, commissioned in 1974 to 1977. The reactors supply Bilbino with a population of around 5,000 people, many of whom are employed by the plant, with electricity, heated water and steam. The EGP-6, the acronym standing for Power Heterogeneous Loop Reactor, are SMRs that are scaled-down versions of the larger RBMK design. Both use water for cooling and graphite as a neutron moderator, and the EGP-6 reactors are the only reactors to be built on permafrost. As of 2020, the power plant was ready for decommissioning, to be replaced by the academic Lomonsov floating nuclear power plant. The first EGP-6 reactor was shut down in December 2018, and the other three EGP-6 reactors were scheduled to follow in December 2021. However, a decision was made in 2020 to renew the license of one of the three reactors until December 2025. Russia has a number of nuclear SMRs in design and development stages, including the BREST reactor, a lead-cooled fast reactor, the main characteristics of which are passive safety and a closed fuel cycle. Lead is chosen as a coolant for being high-boiling, radiation-resistant, low activated and at atmospheric pressure. So commentary, Alana, here. Graham's mention of the RBMK reactor design triggered something in the dim, dark recesses of my memory, so I followed his links through to Wikipedia. You might be interested to know that, according to Wikipedia, the RBMK reactor has a quite significant design flaw that didn't become apparent until the Chernobyl disaster. Yes, Chernobyl was an RBMK reactor. Suddenly the narrative that the coalition is pushing about SMRs being this new technology that's somehow safer, more reliable, that being small and modular somehow makes them more user-friendly, really gets put into perspective when you realise that the only functional land-based Russian SMRs are baby Chernobyl reactors. Funny how everyone pushing nuclear as a solution for Australia neglects to mention that. And now for some context on the BREST reactor. Passive nuclear safety is a design approach for safety features implemented in a nuclear reactor that does not require any active intervention on the part of the operator in order to bring the reactor to a safe shutdown state in the event of a particular type of emergency like a meltdown, where the reactor runs out of coolant and overheats. And we can thank the Chernobyl disaster for that. Human error and human failure were significant contributors to Chernobyl being Chernobyl. If you're not one for research, go watch the incredible Chernobyl miniseries to see what happened. Oh, and a closed fuel cycle means that the spent nuclear fuel gets reprocessed, which means it goes through a chemical process to separate out the fission products and actinides from the spent fuel. Reprocessing was originally developed to extract weapons-grade plutonium from the spent fuel, but with the commercialisation of reactors, the plutonium gets reprocessed into fuel for thermal reactors. Reprocessing the fuel implies that the spent fuel somehow gets recycled or reused, but that's not really the case. You still end up with radioactive waste at the end of the fuel cycle that has to be managed and disposed of. A fuel cycle where the spent fuel doesn't get reprocessed is referred to as an open fuel cycle, and you end up with the same nuclear waste to manage at the end of that process. There are links in the drill to cover all of this. Anyway, back to it. In the USA, the only commercial SMR project to receive design certification from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, an essential step before construction can commence, was cancelled in November 2023. The Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems Project, UAMPS, 
was the developer of a nuclear SMR project called the Carbon Free Power Project, with a gross capacity of 462 megawatts and planned to be fully operational by 2030. In late 2022, UAMPS updated their capital cost to $31,100 per kilowatt, citing the global inflationary pressures that have increased the cost of all electricity generation. Commentary, Alana here. To put that in context, the capital cost of renewables ranges from around $1,300 to $1,700 per kilowatt. The CSIRO GenCost report states that, quote, This estimate implies that nuclear SMRs have been hit by a 70% cost increase, which is much larger than the average 20% observed in other technologies. The significant increase in costs likely explains the cancellation of the project. This was the only proposed SMR in the USA with regulatory approval. So what is the cost of electricity production using nuclear SMRs? Each year, the CSIRO and the Australian Energy Market Operator, AEMO, work with industry and key stakeholders to produce cost estimates for new build electricity generation in Australia, which is the Gen Cost report that we just referred to. This is Australia's most comprehensive electricity generation cost projection report. The 2023-2024 draft Gen Cost report was recently released. It utilises the Levelised Cost of Electricity, LCOE, cost comparison metric, being, quote, the total unit cost a generator must recover to meet all its costs, including a return on investment, unquote. High and low cost estimates are used to produce an an LCOE range for each technology. GenCost stated that, quote, the LCOE cost range for variable renewables wind and solar power, with integration costs is the lowest of all new build technologies in 2023 and is predicted to be lowest in 2030. The range cost overlaps slightly with the lower end of the cost range for coal and gas generation, but those costs are only achievable if they can deliver a high capacity, source low-cost fuel and be financed at a rate that does not include climate policy risk despite their high emissions, which is a non-viable option. If we exclude high emission generation options, coal and gas, the next most competitive generation technology is gas with carbon capture and storage, end quote. And Graham has included a graph in the drill, which you can see online. For nuclear SMRs, GenCost stated that conflicting data has been published. Projects completed or in construction in Russia and China are 100% government funded and, as indicated above, the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems Project was cancelled in November 2023 due to cost overruns. Costs for all technologies increased in 2022-2023. The cost increase for large-scale solar was the lowest at 9% and this increase was expected to be reversed in 2023-2024 with a cost decline of 8% predicted. Onshore wind saw significant increases in costs in 2022-2023 of 35%, with a further increase of 8% expected in 2023-2024. According to the CSIRO, cost pressures were likely to remain for new build gas, onshore wind and nuclear SMRs. So what about nuclear waste and nuclear SMRs? The management of spent nuclear fuel appears to have had limited consideration. For countries embarking or willing to embark on an SMR program, whether they are nuclear countries or newcomers, understanding the implications of the spent fuel management program that would need to be undertaken is important to make informed decisions on the specificities of different SMR technologies and on the fuel cycle options. In a recent article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, May 31, 2022, the author stated that remarkably few studies have analysed the management and disposal of nuclear waste streams from SMRs. Yet results reveal that water, molten salts and sodium-cooled SMR designs 
will increase the volume of nuclear waste in need of management and disposal by factors of 2 to 30-fold, attributed to the use of neutron reflectors and or of chemically reactive fuels and coolants. In addition, SMR spent fuel will contain relatively high concentrations of fissile nuclides, which will demand novel approaches for storage and disposal. Since waste stream properties are influenced by neutron leakage, a basic physical process that is enhanced in small reactor cores, SMRs will exacerbate the challenges of nuclear waste management and disposal. The authors conclude that SMRs will exacerbate the volume and complexity of low and intermediate level waste and spent nuclear fuel and will offer no apparent benefit in the development of a safety case for geological repositories. Context, Alana here. What all of that is saying is that not only will small modular reactors create more nuclear waste than conventional reactors, the waste they produce is likely to be more difficult to store and manage. Which is great news for a country like Australia that has no nuclear waste disposal or storage facilities or any expertise in managing nuclear waste. And if anyone suggests to you that we can just go bury it out in the desert, the desert might be completely inhospitable to human life, but it's not a dead, sterile environment. There's life out there. The desert is an ecosystem, and burying radioactive waste out there would destroy it. There's a reason why the federal ban on nuclear was negotiated by the Democrats as part of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Because even if the economics of nuclear power stack up, which they don't, it doesn't stack up environmentally. Arguing for nuclear as a solution to the climate emergency makes as much sense as committing genocide for world peace. Or, to put it into context for our younger listeners, it's like saying that Thanos was right in wiping out half the population of the universe. And if you can sit through all those Marvel movies and end up on Thanos' side, I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, before I end up turning this into a pop culture podcast, let's get back to the drill. So what are other countries doing? A number of governments feel that nuclear SMR technology may be applicable to their energy mix. On the 8th of December 2023, according to a World Nuclear News report, which draws comment from intergovernmental agencies, uranium miners, nuclear equipment manufacturers and the nuclear power generation industry, Poland's Ministry of Climate and Environment issued a decision in principle for the construction of 24 BWRX 300 SMRs at six locations. In the USA, the current Palisades large nuclear plant in Michigan was shut down in May 2022 after 50 years in service, with decommissioning envisaged for completion in 2041. However, after its sale, the new owner, Holtec, filed for authorization to refurbish the large reactor for power operations to recommence in 2025 and to add two nuclear SMR 300 units to the site by 2030. Holtec stated that this would eliminate delays associated with erecting the SMRs at an undeveloped property. However, at present, the Palisades reactor is classed by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission as being in, quote, full decommissioning, unquote. In March 2011, one quarter of Germany's electricity was generated using nuclear power from 17 reactors. However, a number of subsequent governments responded to public pressure by progressively closing those plants and the decommissioning of the Emsland, ISAR-2 and Necker westheim reactors by April 16, 2023, saw the cessation of all nuclear energy production in Germany. Meanwhile, Sweden, with a population less than half of Australia at 10.64 million, had also called for closure of its nuclear reactors in 1980 and has only six of its original 12 reactors still in operation. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 caused a sharp increase in energy prices in Europe and Swedish concerns about energy security caused further shutdowns to be cancelled. In fact, On the 16th of November 2023, the government announced that it may expand its current nuclear energy production to help meet projected power demands and net zero carbon emissions from the power sector by 2045. 
The government said it aimed to build the equivalent of two new conventional nuclear reactors by 2035 to meet demand from industry and transport, and was prepared to take on some of the costs. By 2045, the government wants to have the equivalent of 10 new reactors, some of which are likely to be SMRs. Of note, the current Swedish Prime Minister, Ulf Christensen, runs a minority government that relies on confidence and supply from the nationalist right-wing Swedish Democrats, who have called for an expansion of nuclear energy. And there are links in the drill for further reading. So now we've reached the discussion part of the drill. Where does this leave Australia? At present, nuclear power production with battery storage appears to be a viable and cost-effective option. Some amount of gas power is expected to be required to provide firming, and emissions from gas could be abated using carbon capture and storage, although example projects have captured only a limited percentage of the emissions generated. When completed, pumped hydro from Snowy 2.0 will also provide rapid on-demand power when generation from renewables fluctuates. This combination of options is the cheapest predicted source of power production through to 2030. After that, nuclear SMRs may be available as viable, competitive power options, but at present, that is not the case. In addition, with no current nuclear power generation, but with huge opportunities in the production of clean renewable energy by solar and wind, together with the export of clean metals and low-carbon industrial goods, The need for SMRs is unnecessary and a potential distraction from accessible, cheaper technologies. Based on current experience in China, Russia and the USA, if Australia invested in SMR technology, there would be significant risks in relation to costs and potential delays. We certainly do need to carefully consider the vulnerability of our power production and the vicissitudes of international trade partners, particularly China, following recent trade restrictions. However, risks to renewable supply chains can be mitigated by diversifying sources of solar and wind technology and by investing in local renewable manufacture and research. It's worth remembering that solar production in China was largely based on research from the University of New South Wales, which had just invented a cell design that went on to become the global commercial standard. After working with the research team, a student from Shanghai took that research back to China and founded the nation's first solar manufacturing company, SunTech. It listed on the New York Stock Exchange in 2005, heralding the start of a Chinese solar boom. Context, Alana, here. That UNSW student ended up taking his research back to China for development because he couldn't get commercial funding here in Australia. We could have been the epicentre of the solar panel boom that China is now leading. Back to the drill. It is interesting to examine Germany's energy mix during the progressive shutdown of nuclear. Germany has boosted clean energy by 44% since 2015 and has reduced fossil fuel power by 11%. Solar and wind each provided 29% of the energy mix in 2022, at which point nuclear provided 4%, coal 18% and gas 11%. Despite high electricity costs, many Germans feel that the shutdown of nuclear will benefit the energy transition. Solar and wind generation fluctuate, but nuclear provides continuous power, so batteries, pumped hydro or gas are more readily integrated with wind and solar generation than nuclear. Commentary liner here. Because nuclear provides continuous power, You can't turn it off when you don't need it and then turn it back on again when you do, which is why no one's talking about nuclear as a firming option for renewables. We either go down the renewables path where battery technology is improving quickly and costs are steadily dropping, or we go down the nuclear path where we might have a functional but very expensive reactor in about 20 years if we're lucky and we rely on fossil fuels in the meantime. Back to the drill. Finally, there is the not insurmountable but nevertheless difficult issue of the siting of nuclear facilities and nuclear waste disposal. For some years, Australia has been developing the innovative nuclear waste technology SINROC, which provides a matrix for nuclear waste disposal, 
but waste from SMRs will be greater and potentially more difficult to dispose of than waste from larger nuclear facilities. Waste disposal and siting of nuclear facilities will continue to pose problems within urban, rural and remote communities and for Indigenous peoples. In summary, based on the evidence I have accessed, Australia should not look to nuclear SMRs at this point or in the intermediate future. If we are actually technology neutral and if we want greater surety of supply, then nuclear SMRs are not currently our way ahead. A political focus on SMRs in our energy mix could also delay the transition to viable, attainable, cost-effective, clean energy alternatives to fossil fuels. Firstly, Thank you so much to Dr. Graham Elder for doing all that research so you and I didn't have to. So what have we learned today? Well, we've learned that small modular reactor technology isn't commercially viable. And judging by the failure of the one attempt in the US to make it commercially viable because it was too expensive, it's not likely to become commercially viable in time for Peter Dutton to become Prime Minister and implement it. On top of that, small modular reactors are going to produce more nuclear waste that's likely to be more dangerous and difficult to store and dispose of. And being modular, we're going to end up with more reactors. And the more reactors you have producing energy, the more opportunities these reactors have to melt down, and therefore the greater the risk of a meltdown. And you don't need good old human incompetence to put you at risk of a meltdown Just ask the operators of the Fukushima reactor in Japan, which melted down after it got flooded by a tsunami. I guess the good news for those electorates that were underwater or on fire, or in some cases both, over the last few years, is that you probably won't end up on Peter Dutton's list of possible sites to build a nuclear reactor, since he's unlikely to want to risk a natural disaster triggering a meltdown. I'll be honest with you, this whole nuclear thing being a thing? is frankly baffling to me. It was suggested on the New Politics podcast that if it were Labor suggesting nuclear as a solution, Dutton would be hammering renewables like there's no tomorrow for no other reason than he has to oppose whatever it is Labor's putting forward, which is straight out of the Tony Abbott opposition playbook. And we've had over a decade of discovering how Tony Abbott's approach to politics harms not just our democracy, but the country as a whole. John Birmingham wrote a column about this last week and summed it up much better than I have. The politics are radioactive, with both federal and state bans on nuclear power in place, meaning that what Dutz wants to do is literally a crime. His policy is to do some nuclear-powered criming. He'll have to convince not just the Senate, which he does not and will not control, to lift the ban at the federal level, but then he has to somehow ride over a bunch of state premiers and parliaments waiting for him with baseball bats fashioned from weapons-grade plutonium. Good luck with that, buddy. None of this explains why he's doing it. A cynic might imagine that maybe it's just the mining companies pulling his strings, but solar panels and grid-scale batteries don't grow in artisanal groves of silicon trees and lithium vines. They get dug out of the earth and manufactured in gigantic industrial plants. The mining companies will do just fine out of renewables. So why? Why do this? Could it be that he actually believes in this stuff? Because that kind of delusion is enough to ensure a long, long stay in the wilderness. I'm not actually sure what's worse The possibility that Dutton is very cynically arguing for nuclear to appease the climate-denying, renewables-hating, right-wing majority in the Liberal and National parties, or that he actually believes this nonsense. I hope we've clarified what on earth small modular reactors are and why they're not the answer to our low-carbon future. I will be back soon to chat to our candidate for Dunkley, Heath McKenzie, and Graham is working on another instalment of The Drill. Keep an eye out for that on our website. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. 
If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, the platform formerly known as Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Spoutable, YouTube and TikTok by searching for Australian Democrats. And you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Email us at info at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.